back to Leading Entrepreneurs of the World, our 2022 uh, conference. We are joined uh, today by our good friend, Dr. Christian Bush, best-selling author and NYU and London School of Economics professor. Uh, Christian's gonna talk to us today about connecting the dots, the science of serendipity as a tool for innovation and impact. We look forward to hearing your thoughts, Christian. Welcome back. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, and let me hand it off to you. Thank you so much, uh, Glenn and uh, Silius, for the introduction and uh, having me. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to be here with you today. Uh, I'd like to take you on a journey, a journey of connecting the dots, using the science of serendipity as a tool for innovation and impact. To give you a bit of context, uh, you know, I used to be that kid in high school who was thrown out of high school, had a repeat a year, probably held the unofficial world record of how many dustbins you could knock over on your way to school when you're driving. And then one day wasn't so lucky anymore and crashed into four parked cars, all cars completely destroyed, including my own. And I won't forget the policeman who came to the scene and he was like, oh my God, he's still alive. And you know, that stuck with me, uh, that idea that I was supposed to be dead. And I asked myself all these weird questions, you know, if I would have died, who would have come to my funeral? Who would have actually cared? Was it all worth it? And at that point I had mostly depressing answers. And so I started reading a book that I recently reread actually. I had a, a another near-death experience recently, and I reread the book. It's highly recommended for the times we live in. And, and I started reading that book, Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. And it was all about the question of how do we find meaning in tough situations? How do we find meaning in crisis? And you know, what I realized is where I find a lot of meaning is connecting ideas, connecting people, and, and that spark that comes from when they meet and, 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 and interact. And so I started out as a, as a community builder. We created a community called Sandbox Network that brings together the young innovators around the world and helps them make ideas happen. And then, um, you know, went more into entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship, and later into academia. And what I found fascinating on this journey of, uh, you know, creating companies, communities, and then studying ideas and what makes people successful is that wherever I went, the most interesting, successful, purpose-driven people, they seem to have something in common, which is that they intuitively cultivate serendipity. They see and leverage the value in the unexpected. And that's what I'd love to talk about today. How do we develop the muscle for the, the, the ability to connect the dots and be able to turn the unexpected into positive outcomes? Now, why is that important at the moment? You know, there's a lot of challenges, of course, we're all facing. There's a lot of individual uncertainty. There's, um, you know, a lot of us might go through transitions. A lot of us might be on a deep search for meaning at the moment, given the collective near-death experience we, we recently had with, with COVID and so. And um, there's a lot of complex societal challenges, right, that are so complex that we can't just map them out for the next 20 years anymore. And so life is, is, is shaped by the unexpected. So building a muscle for that is, is what I want to talk about today. Now, to make sure we're on the same page, here are a couple of examples of serendipity. Uh, first one, uh, you know, imagine you have erratic hand movements like I do, then you uh, spill a lot of coffee. So imagine you are in a coffee shop, you spill coffee over someone, that person looks at you slightly annoyedly, but you sense there might be something there. You don't know what it is. You just sense there might be something there. Now you have a couple of options, right? One option is you just say, I'm sorry. You walk outside and you think, ah, what could have happened had I spoken with that person? Another option might be you start that conversation and that person turns out to become the love of your life, your co-founder, your next hiking buddy, you name it. The point is our reaction to the unexpected. Us making the accident meaningful is what creates the ultimate serendipity. Any ideas what this might be here on the, on the lower left? Any ideas what that might be on the lower left? I think you can use the, the chat function or the, um, the Q&A function. Any ideas what this might be on the lower left? So this is a sweet potato washing machine. And so a couple of years ago, in China, uh, a large white goods company, one of the leading white goods companies in the world, they received calls from farmers. And the farmers told them, your crappy washing machine is always breaking down. Why is the washing machine breaking down? Well, we're trying to wash our potatoes in it and it doesn't seem to work. What would we usually do? We'll probably try to educate the customer right, and tell them, don't wash your potatoes in a washing machine. It's made for, 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 for clothes, not for potatoes. They did the opposite. They said, you know what, that's unexpected but there's probably a lot of farmers in China and the world who have a similar problem. So why don't we build in a dirt filter and make it a potato washing machine? And that's how the potato washing machine became one of their key products. Any ideas what this might be here on the upper right? 
any ideas? And Glenn, thank you for Compactor. That was very close. Uh, any ideas what that might be here on the upper right? It's usually a very good sign if not. Um, so a couple of decades ago, uh, some researchers gave people medication against angina pectoris, the heart pain, and they realized there was some unexpected movement in male participants' trousers. So what would we usually do? We'd probably say, oh my God, that's embarrassing that there seems to be an erection happening in male participants' trousers. Or, you know, let's find a better way to cure that side effect, right? So we would probably think about, oh my God, how do we just ignore that that just happened, right? They did the opposite. They said, you know what? That's unexpected that there's this reaction happening. But there's probably a lot of men in the world who might have a problem in that department. So why don't we develop a medication around this? And this is how Viagra, here the generic name Sildenafil, became a best-selling medication uh, in, in, in that regard. And now here, the, the final example recently now, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, uh, a company in Germany called BioNTech, uh, set up by a wife-husband co-founding duo. Um, BioNTech, they, they uh, created mRNA technology against cancer and, and developing cancer vaccines. And then they realized when COVID happened, oh my God, we can use this technology to develop a vaccine. They partnered up with Pfizer and turned it into uh, the first US authorized COVID vaccine. Now, with all these examples in common and hundreds and hundreds of examples that, that we've studied over the last um, 10 years, is that there's there's a there's a it's always the same process, right? It's a it's a science-based framework for how serendipity evolves, which is not just an event. It's not just something that happens to someone. It's a process of spotting and connecting dots. Each of these examples that I just mentioned and the hundreds and hundreds of examples that we studied always have in common that there's this you know unexpected serendipity trigger, right? So movement in male participants' trousers farmers calling up and saying, your crappy washing machine is breaking down, things like this. But then people have to do something with it, right? We have to imbue meaning in it. We have to connect the dots and then actually have the tenacity to go through with it. The beautiful thing is once you look at it as a process, you realize that you can create more potential serendipity triggers. I'll talk about this when I talk about, for example, the hook strategy. We can learn how to connect the dots better and we can develop the tenacity to actually go through with it. And beautifully so, within organizations, within companies, we can create the conditions, the enablers and constraints for serendipity to emerge. Unfortunately, most of the times we miss serendipity because we don't see it, right? We might miss seeing it or we might not be able to connect the dots or we might just not have the tenacity to go through with it. One of my absolute favorites here is, um, you know, if, if you ask in a weekly meeting, for example, what surprised you last week? It's a very simple question. But now if someone observed that customers are using your product differently, they might say, I was really surprised that people used our washing machine to wash potatoes. And that might lead you to your next innovation or cutting a product from your uh, product range because you realize it doesn't fit or whatever it is. And so the point is once we incentivize people to look out for the positively unexpected, they tend to see it more often. It's like, you know, once you start looking for money in the street, you tend to see it more often. Uh, unfortunately, in my case, mostly pennies, so it doesn't really... Um, help my lifestyle, but um, there's, there's a lot to be done here. I want to show an experiment that shows you how important the way we look at the world actually is in that regard. Um, I'd love to ask you, if you want to put in the chat, who of you considers yourself to be a lucky person versus an unlucky person? Lucky versus unlucky. Seems like we, uh, it's a mostly lucky room. So um, that's a good sign. Because, you know, it, it, not for the reasons that it, there's some kind of voodoo to it, that you can just kind of, that luck just falls into your lap and that's it. But for the reason that you will look slightly differently at the world, you will identify opportunities slightly differently. Um, to give you one example of an experiment that I'm a big fan of, they pick people who self-identify as very lucky. So people who say, good things tend to happen to me. And people who self-identify as very unlucky. So people who say, bad things tend to happen to me, I'm always in accidents and so on. And we probably all know people on both sides of, of that continuum. Now, they pick one of each and they say, walk down the street, go into a coffee shop, grab a coffee, sit down, and then we'll have our conversation. What they don't tell them is that there's hidden cameras along the street and inside the coffee shop. There's a five pound note in front of the coffee shop, so money right in front of the coffee shop. And inside the coffee shop, there's one empty seat next to this extremely successful businessman who can make big dreams happen. Now the lucky person walks down the street, sees the five pound note, picks it up, 
goes inside the shop, orders a coffee, sits next to the businessman, they have a conversation, they exchange business cards, and you know, potentially an opportunity coming out of it. The unlucky person walks down the street, steps over the five pound note, so doesn't see it, goes inside the shop, orders a coffee, sits next to the businessman, ignores the businessman, that's it. Now, at the end of the day, they ask both people, how was your day today? The lucky person says, well, it was amazing. I found money in the street, made a new friend, and you know, potentially an opportunity coming out of it. The unlucky person just says, well, nothing really happened. And, and that's really what a lot of times, um, you know, when you put people into exactly the same situations, um, there's a lot of experiments around this, how they react differently to the unexpected if they see the possibly unexpected, but also if they actually engage on it. And there's a lot of hope for closet introverts like myself. You know, of course, when you start to talk with someone, it, it opens up a, more of an opportunity space. But again, you only find the money once you open your eyes to it. And you, you, if you take another route to work in the morning and you open your eyes to, oh my God, there's a bookstore and, and in that shelf, there's this book that could be a podcast, right? That's where those unexpected ideas come from once we open our eyes to, to those ideas. Now, how do we do that? And, and what holds us back from doing more of this? Um, you know, there's, there's um, one of our key self-limiting constraints that a lot of us have is that we tend to post-rationalize, right? So um, I work a lot with senior executives. And if you have a CEO who comes into the boardroom, they will tell you, I had this strategy, then I made exactly this happen, and then exactly this happened, right? Yeah, but real life probably is a bit more like a squiggle, right? And so we tend to airbrush serendipity out of our stories because we want to portray control, we want to portray authority. But what that does is it usually silences all these beautiful, potentially serendipitous ideas that could come up because it delegitimizes the idea that the unexpected is the potential source of, um, of, of strategy and, and of, of potential success. We just finished a study with over 40 of the world's leading CEOs, you know, people who run companies like MasterCard and, and others who have been successful in what they're doing. We sat down with them and we said, what is it that truly makes you successful? And one of the key themes that came out of it is that they're extremely good at saying, here's a sense of direction. If I am MasterCard, I want to get 500 million people into the financial system who were previously unbanked. That's now our sense of direction where we're going. Here's our strategy. But we're telling you already now that we will adjust that strategy based on new information coming in. So now if someone unexpectedly comes with a new solution, that becomes part of the plan. That's not a threat to authority. That's not a threat to that the leader didn't see it coming, but the opposite. The leader told from the beginning, this is part of our plan. And so the beautiful thing is once we legitimize the unexpected as part of our plan, we allow people to raise that, especially also junior people, right? Pixar, the uh, company that Steve Jobs was leading for some time, they had this beautiful practice where the meetings would start, at Goodman would start the meeting and say, at the beginning, all of our ideas are bad. Now let's start the meeting. Or all of our movies are bad. Let's start the meeting now. And so what you're doing here is you're giving people the license to have these you know, unexpected ideas that maybe are not mature enough yet, but they can still bring them up. Because in a way, um, you, know, you don't have to pretend that you have every, everything already mapped out. And, and that's really kind of at the core of, of, of a lot of this, this work. Now, what are some practices um, that, that, that allow us to have more serendipity happen? One of my absolute favorites is the hook strategy. The hook strategy is what every really good salesperson in a way intuitively does a lot of times, which is taking memorable talking points and seeding them into conversation. So someone who does that really well is Ollie Barrett. He's an entrepreneur in London. And if you would ask Ollie this dreaded, what do you do question that we all get right at the conference, wherever we are, he wouldn't just say, I'm an entrepreneur or I'm a businessman or whatever. He would say, I'm an education entrepreneur, recently started reading into the philosophy of science, but what I'm really excited about is playing the piano. And so what he's doing here is he's giving you three potential hooks where you could be like, oh my God, such a coincidence. We recently started a piano club, you should stop by. Oh my God, such a coincidence. My sister is teaching on the philosophy of science. You should give a guest lecture. The point is we can all think about what are three or four key interests or curiosities we have at the moment. I wanna to expand to Hungary. I wanna open up a new store in Los Angeles, whatever it is. And then seeding that into conversations with whoever it is, and then in the most unexpected of places, the friend of our dad's mother's father's friend might unexpectedly know someone who has exactly the solution to our problem. And so it's really kind of opening that opportunity space. On the other hand, of course, also, how do we ask questions? Do we just ask the, what do you do? Or do we ask kind of questions like, what do you enjoy doing? Very simple shift, but what it does is it opens up 
the space away from autopilot into let's have a conversation where we can find overlaps. A second practice is around looking at mistakes and crisis differently. That's one of my favorites, um, especially the project funeral. The project funeral is all about saying, usually when something goes wrong in an organization, we try to hide it, right? We don't want to be the loser, the failure who kind of mess something up. But actually, that's the real source of learning a lot of times. That's a lot of times the real source of where interesting stuff comes from. And so the project funeral is about saying, whenever a project doesn't work, the project manager who's responsible for it lays it to rest in front of project managers from other divisions and reflects on what they learned from it. So it's not about celebrating failure. It's about celebrating the learning from what didn't work. And so in this one example, uh, you know, they had this amazing technology, a window glass that wouldn't reflect the light. Amazing technology. But the project manager laid it to rest and said, look, we learned that next time we have to understand the market better. It wasn't big enough for that. Now, someone in the audience goes, hey, 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 have you considered if you would use this technology in a solar context, how much energy that could absorb? And that's how, quote unquote, serendipitously part of their solar division emerged and, and became one of the businesses. It was also a beautiful way, by the way, to build trust and to build that feeling that, hey, I don't always have to pretend that I know everything and, and have everything. Two more practices, and then I'll wrap this up. And I think, Glenn, then we can dive into a conversation um, um, for, for the rest of the session. Um, the third um, is, is really around um, uh, the, the, the North Star that I discussed. But, but my, my absolute favorite at the moment, right? The question always is, in a world that, that is becoming more virtual, where you know we're part in the office, part not, how do we recreate those water cooler moments? How do we recreate those moments where we actually allow people to bump into each other coincidentally and have those amazing ideas come? And one of my favorite practices here is the random coffee trial. And the random coffee trial is about the idea that people across the organization sign up for a couple of times when they're free, and then they get randomly matched with people across the organization for a quick coffee based on an inspirational prompt. It could be something like, what's the challenge you're facing at the moment and how can I help you or whatever it is. And usually what happens is a lot of times those kind of conversations then lead to this, oh my God type moments, but also they recreate this feeling of, oh, I'm part of something bigger than just my small project team, right? We, 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 we have a lot of interactions with people, but always the same people. So we could be in our project team in any other company, but to recreate that feeling that we belong to a company, it's really kind of these cross uh, divisional uh, cross siloing connections that can help us to break out of that and, and, and create that, that certainty. And then last but not least, um, it, it's really about um, simple steps, right? Space design, we can think about how do we design spaces in ways. I mean, um, I always remember Steve Jobs when he, um, uh, you know, with Pixar, um, uh, they, they uh, needed a new headquarters. And the architects came to him and, you know, they were like, okay, you need a new headquarters. We want to have three buildings, one for the management team, one for the developers and one for the creatives. And he said, that's the worst that they've ever had in my life. Like these are exactly the people that should be in the same building rather than selected into siloed other buildings. So he said, let's do one big building. Let's do a big atrium in the middle. And then let's put the mailbox of the management person right next to the mailbox of the developer, right next to the mailbox of the creative so that they actually have to bump into each other. And by in a way, nudging people so that they have to bump, especially in those people they usually don't bump into, you essentially then see, oh my God, that person actually isn't as nerdy as I thought they would be, or this person is actually much cooler than I thought, right? Those kind of things where you actually then allow people to have those kind of interactions that they usually wouldn't have. And so there's a lot we can do with space design. Bloomberg does a lot around this Google in terms of how they allocate office space differently, right? How do you make sure that the water cooler, for example, or the coffee machine is close to the door so that people, when they come in, like bump into people who are in the queue, things like this, where there's a lot of things we can do in terms of space design of how we um, um, enable those kind of interactions. But for now, um, you know, let's close on a philosophical note. I wouldn't do justice to my heritage in Germany, where we have this beautiful philosopher's way in Heidelberg, where Goethe was writing a lot of his poems. And he had this beautiful idea that if you take someone as they are, you make them worse. But if you take them as what you could be, you make them capable of becoming what they can be. And that's what serendipity is about. Serendipity is about potentiality. Once you start to see something in the unexpected, you connect the dots to so many different uh, things that could be valuable to yourself and to others. And that's also one of the ways, you know, imagine a world where we don't see the unexpected only as a source of 
you know, interrupting our plans or despair or anxiety, but actually a source of meaning of joy and, and of potential opportunity. That's a world where we would create companies and schools and universities that actually create spaces for that serendipity, right? And that's a space where also maybe we don't push our kids just to always have the perfect plan, but actually to build, develop a muscle for the, for the unexpected. And that's really behind this in terms of the philosophical thoughts. Here's the book. That's the serendipity mindset that, that brings it all together. A lot of exercise manager mentions. I should mention that this is out now, um, so it's available. And with this, thank you so much for joining. And uh, over to you, Glenn. Thank, thank you, Christian. I've actually been to that university in Frankfurt a long time ago for a, for a conference when I was with the, uh, the Stock Exchange. So how about, how about that for a, a recollection? Wow, so, much, so many great stuff. Some, uh, some, some, some really interesting tie-ins, too. Uh, you know, on the, trow of the trow whole trouser thing, uh, the very first episode of uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm was called The Pants Tent. <laughs> and it kind of it kind of carried around a similar type of uh, type of uh, type of topic. You know, it's interesting the um, the empty seat concept. You know, one of the most cherished relationships I have was because somebody took a chance and sat next to me at a at a conference dinner because there was an empty seat next to me. And the way the way she always tells the story was, had she known I was an accountant, she never would have sat next to me. But that only came out like after, as we were wrapping up the evening, she goes, oh, by the, by the way, what do you do? I said, well, I'm an accountant. She says, you're kidding. <laughs> I've, I've never met an accountant like you before, right? So sometimes sometimes those, those types of chances really, really, really are significant, you know? Uh, I, um, an old partner of mine, when I was at uh, in public accounting, he used to call them the, um, the collision factors, right? The bumping in. I love the idea of the random coffee truck. What a, what a great idea of getting in the mailbox idea, getting, getting, getting uh, executives or people from all different levels at an organization uh, to kind of be you know, mixed in with everyone else. What, what, a, what, a, great, what a great suggestion. Uh, you, know, you mentioned uh, Bloomberg. Uh, when when Mike, Michael Bloomberg became uh, mayor of New York, his first move was to move his, his, his desk to the center of the floor. And he was in. The, he was in. He was amongst everybody else. He didn't keep the you know the door the door walled off offers. He was. He wanted to be right on the floor with everybody. I, everybody else, because that's where the best ideas came from. You know, all, all, all along it as as we went. So I, I also the the hook strategy. Tremendous tremendous advice, right? Give people a couple of bites of the apple, because you don't know where someone's interest may be or where it may may otherwise start, right? And before you know it. Uh, you're developing a relationship, you're, work, you're working together, you're, you're getting that interconnectivity. And it all comes from perhaps like, oh, by the way, I'm playing piano. I'm learning how to play piano, right? Just fantastic, just fantastic. Now the book, the book's available now, right? Yes. It yeah, is, it's, it is. It's, it, it's out as, as we go, terrific. Uh, from a you know, cultural standpoint, how, how tough is that? How, how, you know, when, you, when you work with organizations and executives and things, how much of the culture sometimes is, is really, you're, you're, you have to front load it? When you, when you work with them? It's a great question because, you know, everyone's always talking about innovation and change, but nobody really likes it when they're affected by it, right? So, so once your position will change because of expose innovation or, or, or change, then that's kind of obviously causing a little bit of resistance a lot of times in, in organizations. And so um, what, what I found extremely helpful is to rubber stamp forward in terms of saying, hey, look, like none of this has to happen all at the same time. We don't have to all at the same time change everything, but actually... We can use practices. We can start with in the weekly meeting, ask what surprised you last week. Then when we legitimize it, then as a leader, we can start to tell stories about serendipity in, in our life, how we got a strategy or something that then legitimizes it for others to say, oh, I can actually, yes, like this, this depicts much more my living reality than if we pretend that, you know, we always have everything figured out. And so what I've seen is that as people then get more and more into it, so it's less about pushing everything at once at someone, but really saying, how do you kind of after and after get people into the modus of, hey, the unexpected isn't our enemy. The unexpected actually will make sure that we constantly innovate. It will make sure that we're constantly open to where the world is going. Um, and I think that's interesting, right? Because when you think about during the pandemic, right? If you're a brewery um, that for a hundred years, like family traditional company would be focused on brewing alcohol, that's who you are, right? So, so your identity now is we are a brewery and we have the best beer in the world. 
And then COVID happens and you're like, oh, wow, none of the restaurants buys our beer anymore. If you now have that serendipity mindset, what you're doing is to say, okay, let's look at our capabilities. Our capabilities are, we are really good with alcohol. We have a lot of alcohol here. We have a lot of capabilities that we can use for, you know, different things. Why don't we then use that alcohol for hand sanitizer and turn it into a hand sanitizer company? That's how some huge hand sanitizer companies came about, right? By, by saying we, we now have the existing infrastructure already to develop this. And so it's fascinating to see, I think, the old school mindset, which is let's kind of like then dig even deeper and like, like try even harder to be a really good brewery versus to say maybe our capabilities fit the new world actually much better in X, Y, Z ways without giving up our identity. And so I think that's where it gets really interesting to redefine the identity, redefine the North Star. A lot of our work is around purpose-driven leadership where the question was is how do you anchor your purpose in your legacy, but also go with the flow and where the world is going and, and use these new challenges to re-anchor your capabilities. Yeah, you know, you take those legacies, you share them, you build new ones, and, and really everybody wins at the end of the day. And, and, and the organization and the, and, and, the, and, the, uh, and the people grow, and they grow together, which is, which is really wonderful. Well, listen, Dr. Christian Bush, thank you for connecting the dots for us here uh, on uh, day one of Leading Entrepreneurs of the World 2022. Uh, really appreciate your insights. It was great to be with you again this time, and we look forward to seeing you next time, okay? Thank you so much. See you soon. Take good care. Be well. Thank Bye. you.